When we return to the house, my father calls Dr. Gibson. I hang around in the den so that I can hear him in the kitchen. I just wondered how the baby was doing. I hear my father say into the phone. That's good, right? My father says. Where is she now? He asks. She'll be there how long? Does she have a name yet? Baby Doris, my father repeats. He sounds surprised, taken aback. You say she'll go into a foster car? It seems so. Dr. Gibson must make a comment about foster care and adoption because my father says, yes, cold. I can hear my father pouring himself a cup of coffee. When the system doesn't work, what happens? She'd be prosecuted, though. Thanks, my father says. I just wanted to know that the baby was okay. My father hangs up the phone. I move into the kitchen. He's sipping the lukewarm coffee and looking out the kitchen window. Hey, he says when he hears me. She's all right, I ask. She's fine. They've named her baby Doris, apparently. He sets the mark down. Going to Switzer's, he says. Want to come? I don't have to be asked twice to accompany my father on a trip to town. My father holds the door for me when we enter the hardware store. Mr. Switzer looks up from the paper he has spread across the counter next to the register. Our local hero, he says. You heard, my father says. Front page. See for yourself. My father and I make our way to the counter in a newspaper known for its high school sports news. Sunday comics and coupons. I can see a headline that reads Infant found in snow. Below that is another smaller headline. Local carpenter finds baby alive in bloody sleeping bag. I bend closer to the counter and read the paper with my father. The reporter has largely got the story right. There is mention of the motel, the Volvo, and of the Navi Picot. There is no mention of me. Got your name spelled wrong? Switzer says. Yeah, I saw that, my father says. Dylan, it happens all the time. You want me to cut it out for you? My father shakes his head. So what happened? Switzer asks. My father unzips his jacket. The store is heated by a thick wood stove in the corner that makes the temperature fluctuate between 90 degrees and 60. Today it feels like 80. Nikki and I were taking a walk when we heard a cry. My father says. We thought it might be an animal at first. And then we heard the sound of a car door shutting. The baby was in a sleeping bag? Switzer asks. My father nods. Where does the thing? Switzer says, smoothing the pink strands of her over his head. He has recently shaved his beard, revealing a sunken chin and strange pale skin like a new lawyer on an animal that's just molted. You wouldn't think. No, you wouldn't think, my father says. It's like those fairy tales my wife used to read the kids. Switzer says, Carpenter goes into the woods and finds a baby. In a fairy tale it would be a princess. My father says. You should be so lucky, Switzer says. 
for a hardware store in the no man's land between Hanover and Concord, Switzer carries an impressive array of tools. Switzer likes their he heft and shape, he says, much as my father does. Beyond the shelves of tools are other shelves of Pyrex dishes, boxes of Miracle Grow, dusty now in the off season, and cans of Sherwin Williams paint. Attached to the store is a smaller, shit like annex in which Switzer sells Anticus. The word Anticus used loosely. Much of the furniture is from the 60s. That couple make it up to your place last Friday. Switzer asks, What couple? I sent some tourists your way when they started asking for a shaker table. I said you did stuff that looked like shaker. Never saw them, my father says. Your road is crap, Switzer says. Switzer has been saying our, our road is crap ever since we moved into town. For over a year now, he's been sending people my father's way. Only a far half dozen so far have braved the miserable road, but by the time they make the trek, they almost always buy something. I need a level, my father says. What happened to the old one? I cracked the vial. Hard to do. Yeah, well, my father moves to the shelf of levels. His old level, which worked perfectly well until he knocked the glass vial against the refrigerator, had metal rails. He picks up a wooden level. Some of the vials I see are oval, while others are arched. My father points out to me a level that reads in a 360 degree direction. Going to Remy's for a coffee, Switzer says, sliding his arm into a yellow plate jacket. You want one? No, thanks, my father says. Uh, Rakes? No, that's okay. I had breakfast. Nikki, how about you? Switzer asks. You want one? A Drake's coffee cake, I ask. She wants one, Switzer says. When Switzer has left the store, I tell my father I need white paint. I'm skiing Gunstock with Joe after Christmas. How many now? He asks. Seven. I say, referring to the white peaks of my mural. When are you going? My father asks. The day after Christmas. Have you said yes definitely? What's wrong? Can't I go? Grammy will still be here, my father says. So I can't go skiing? I ask my tone, immediately challenging. I can go from zero to all out rage in less than five seconds now. No, you can go. My father says, you should ask first is what I'm saying. I might have had plans, might have been going somewhere. That, I say, my voice notched up to incredulity, we never go anywhere. I pick out a pint of linen white and walk over to study the antiques. There's a maple bedroom set and a rusty green plate sofa. A jukebox is in a corner. I wonder if it works. Switzer pats his shoulder through the door and enters, bearing a coffee cup and a Drake's cake. My father selects the level with the fixed vial. He brings it to the counter and pays for it. With my father's change, Switzer gives him a small rectangle of newsprint. Cut it out anyway, Switzer says. My father pulls out of Switzer's parking lot the level and the clipping on my lap. He hits in the direction of home. I take a bite of the Drake's cake, 
weak ramps falling down the front of my parka. Dad, I say, we need food. You make a list? No, but we need milk and Cheerios, I say. Bread for sandwiches, Bologna, stuff for dinner. I don't want to go to Remy's, he says. Enough of the local hero stuff. My father does a 180 and hits for Batson's Market, a store farther out of town that he can sometimes get in and out of without running into anyone he knows. We pass the mobile station and the Shepherd Village School, a one-room schoolhouse built in 1780, the schoolhouses of the town's key six, the playground is a gravel front yard. Older students are boosted out of town to the regional, a trip that takes, in my case, 40 minutes each way. Beside the school is the Congregational Church, a white clapboarded building with long windows and black shutters. The church has a steeply pitched roof and a tower with a bell. Neither my father nor I has ever been inside it. We pass the three stately homes in town, one after another on a hill, two of which have seen better days. We pass Serenity Carpets, the Bake House Trailer, the Volunteer Fire Department, Bingo every Thursday, Knit 6.30, and Croydon Realty, to which we drifted in a slow stop the first time we came into town. Croydon Realty, where it's still possible to buy a house for 26,000. Not much of a house, but a house. In the summers, my father and I sometimes go for exploratory drives around the countryside, getting close on backwoods roads, finding small pockets of surprisingly well-tended houses. How do they make a living? My father will always ask. Once we came upon a moose ambling along in front of us, hogging the narrow road. We had to follow it for 20 minutes at 5 miles an hour, not daring to pass it, learning to like the gentle jog of the animal's ramp. After Croydon Realty, there are 4 miles of nothing, just woods with a stream that parallels the road. My father slows and he passes Mercy, the first set of buildings after the gap, the hospital housed in what was once a brick, four-story hotel converted in the 1930s. Although it has since sprouted modern wings, the words the Hotel 1898 are still inscribed over the front door of the original building. Dad, let's stop, I say. I want to see her. My father stares at the hospital. I know that he would like to see the baby too. But after a few seconds, he shakes his head. Too much red tape, he says, accelerating. Beyond the hospital, in a strip mall into which my father turns, he stops in front of a sign that reads Liquor Outlet, Batson's Market, Family Dollar, Frank, Renata, DDS. Milk, I think, Cheerios, coffee, chicken with stars, American cheese, hamburger meat, maybe some ring dings. With a week's worth of groceries, my father makes the reverse trip, past the hospital, through the gap, or then the realtor, the three stately homes and Remy's and Switzers right across the street from each other. Our own road in, is six miles out of town. Along the way we pass houses with front porches filled 
with coaches and plastic toys and empty propane tanks. One of these houses is a small white clapboard cottage with a tiny fence in backyard. The front porch is nearly crowded with bicycles and tricycles, baseball bats and hockey sticks. Evidence of boys can also be found in the wash on the line. T-shirts in varying sizes, jeans and hockey shirts or bathing suits depending on the season. In the middle of the wash I sometimes see a bra or a slip or a pretty nightgown. When we drive by in the winter we occasionally see the mother struggling with large unwieldy frozen sheets. They look like cardboard and blow with the wind. I always wave at the woman who smiles and waves back. Sometimes in the summers I have an arch to stop my bike and say hello and enter that house and meet the boys and see the cows I imagine there. My father pulls the truck into our driveway. You bought spaghetti, he asks. And ragu sauce, I say. He parks in his usual spot beside the barn. He turns off the engine. Are that okay for supper? It's fine. I bought brayers, he says. I saw. Butter pecan, your favorite. That, I say. What? How did the baby get named Doris? My father reaches for his cigarettes, a nervous gesture, but then he decides against it with me in the truck. I don't know, he says. Maybe it was the name of one of the nurses. It sounds like the name of a hurricane. They probably have a system, he says. You think they get that many babies? I don't think so. I hope not. It's an old-fashioned name, I say. I'm leaning against my door. My father has his hand on his door handle as if we were anxious to get out of the truck. It's a strange name to give a baby these days, he considers. What will happen to her? I ask. Did Dr. Gibson tell you? She'll go into social services, my father says. He puts his hand on the door handle and opens the door a crack. She'll get a new mother and father and new brothers and sisters. Most likely. It doesn't seem right. I say. What doesn't seem right? Us not knowing where she is. That's the way it has to be, Nikki. He opens his door, signaling the end of the conversation. Dad, I ask, what? Why can't we have her? We could go get her and have her with us. The idea uh, is both appalling and sublime. In my 12-year-old mind I have conceived the notion of supplanting one baby with another. As soon as I say the words and catch a glimpse of my father's face, I see what I've done. But as a 12-year-old will do, I become defensive. Why not? I ask with the petulant tongue of the aggrieved and misunderstood, a tone I will shortly learn to master. Did it make you feel like maybe Clara had come back to us? That maybe we are supposed to have her. My father steps out of the truck. He takes a long breath. No, Nikki, it did not, he says. Clara was Clara and this baby is someone else. She is not ours to have. He looks over at the barn and then back at me. Help me get these groceries in the house before the ice cream melts. Dad, it's 20 out, I say. The ice cream isn't going anywhere. But I am saying this to my father's back. He has shut the door and taken a bag of groceries from the back of the truck. I watch him walk toward the house, grieve a hard knot inside his chest. That night the snow freezes again and a furious wind blows. 
I wake to the sound of limbs snapping under the weight of the ice. The cracks resound like gunshots, some muffled, some as sharp as fireworks. The noise rouses me from my bed at daybreak, and I wait at my bedroom window for the light to come up. The woods beyond the cleared lot is littered with broken trees, their branches bent to the ground as though a hurricane had come and gone. I hear my father on the stairs, I pat on my bathrobe and slippers and find him in the kitchen standing beside the Mr. Coffee, waiting for the machine to fill the pot. He's leaning against the sink in his stocking feet, his arms crossed against yet another flannel shirt. His jeans are the same ones he'd been wearing for a week, and I note that his bird can no longer be called stubble. Dad, I say, maybe you should shave. I'm thinking of growing a bird. He wraps his chin. Maybe you should shave. A trickle of coffee emerges from the coffee maker. Trees keep you up? He asks. They woke me up. Lot of clearing in the spring. He bends slightly to look out the window. I'm worried about the roof with all his heavy snow and ice. The pitch is too shallow in the front. I should have done the roof in the fall. I have roofing. Why? I get vertigo. What's vertigo? I ask. Fear of heights. I get dizzy. This is a fact I haven't known about my father. I wonder what else I don't know. He pours himself a cup of coffee. I open the fridge and take out the milk. I should get out there and shower, he says. I help you, I say with enthusiasm. The idea of being able to climb onto the roof and survey our little kingdom is an exciting one. I hate roofing, he says. But on the other hand, I don't relish the idea of a crew hanging out here for the duration of the job. This goes without saying. Another week, he says, and then you are out for Christmas vacation. At Christmas my grandmother will come, as she always does, and cook for us and put up stockings and make a good Christmas. As she likes to say. My father will go through the motions, but I like the cookies and the cleaved oranges and the sight of presents scattered around a tree. You'd better get dressed, he says, or you'll miss the bus. You think we should check first. That maybe it's another snow day. I think you should get dressed, he says. At school, I'm famous. Though the papers haven't mentioned my name, Everyone seems to know that I was there when the baby was found. I am asked for details easy to deliver. I tell about hearing the cries and finding the infant and going to the hospital and being questioned by a detective. The sleeping bag was bloody. Joe asks me at my locker. Joe is nearly as tall as my father. She has blood hair that streams back from her face like the goddess at the prow of a wicking ship. A little, I say. It was mostly the towel that was bloody. So when you give birth, there's blood? She asks. Of course, I say. Where does the blood come from? The placenta, I say, banging my locker shut. Oh, Joe says, puzzled. The fact that I'd come from New York was regarded as exotic when I first arrived in New Hampshire. And it was certainly in my favor that I wasn't a muscle, which is how some of the locals refer to the people who live one state south. Still, I've worked it out that it will take at least two generations, maybe three, before the natives stop referring to my father and me as newcomers. I have two friends at school. 
the Viking goddess and Roger Kelly. The three of us eat lunch together and share some classes and Roger and I are in the school band. Making arrangements to see Joe or Roger after school or on weekends is difficult, however, everything has to be thought about in advance. Joe's mother has made no secret of the fact that she hates the long drive up to our house, but I think she regards my father as suspicious. If there's to be a sleep power, I usually stay at Joe's. I don't have sleep powers with Roger, of course, but we sometimes play basketball after school and I come home on delayed bus. When I lived in New York, I had more than two friends. There were four fourth grade classes in my elementary school alone and there were three elementary schools in our town. I went to sleep powers often and had them at my house as well. I took dance lessons and gymnastics and was a brownie and a girl scout. I had a lavender and white bedroom with a canopy bed and I could fit six or seven girls and their sleeping bags on the thick carpet. We watched movies in the living room and then went upstairs at 11, we, which is the latest my parents would let us stay up. We did our nails or played through or there until after midnight, learning how to fall down giggling without waking my parents. When Clara was six months old, she was moved into her own bedroom next to mine. My friends liked to play with her when they came to visit. They tried to braid her hair, but she never had enough hair for any braid to be satisfying. Her room was yellow and orange and blue, largely because I'd painted one wall with yellow and orange and blue fish in different shapes and sizes fish such as you'd never come across in a lifetime, even in the Caribbean. I sometimes used to wonder, after we moved to New Hampshire, what the new owners did with that room. If they left the yellow and orange and blue fish swimming through the water, or if they painted the wall white, erasing my artwork the way our family seemed to have been erased, with one large crawler. When I first moved to Shepherd, I was rash and raw and prone to sudden fits of weeping, difficult to hide in a one-room schoolhouse. To compensate for my lack of emotional control, I pretended to an air of weariness and disdain, as if as a New Yorker I was so far ahead of my peers that I hardly need bother to pay attention in class. I was disabused of this notion in a gradual way, and by May I'd finally caught up in Matt. In the scrap on our land were dozens of raspberry bushes that my father and I stumbled across one July day, the first summer in New Hampshire. We picked the beers and brought them back to the house and, for a time, ate them with everything on cereal, on ice cream, with stick. Because there were more raspberries on the land than he and I could consume, I decided to sell them at the end of the road. My father encouraged me to ask Switzer if he knew where I might come by a few dozen wooden fluid boxes. Switzer, who seemed to be able to procure almost anything on demand, sold me several tall stacks for five dollars, waiving the payment and selling it alone, which I repaid with pride at the end of the first week. Each morning, in my denim shorts and pastel t-shirts, I would pick the raspberries in the brush and put them in a basket that hung from my shoulder. When I had enough berries, I'd ride my bicycle the length of our dear road to its entrance. Then I had a card table and a plastic lawn chair set up. I'd fill the fruit boxes with the raspberries and then sit and wait. I could count on at least four customers a day. A woman whose name I never did learn 
but who seem to have a lot of house guests. Mrs. Clapper, who was a visiting nurse and who used to take a box each day to one of her patients, Mr. Baldock, who went by every morning to get the newspaper and his mail in town, and Mr. Switzer, who had no reason that I could ever see to drive by our road, but there he was, I don't believe he ever missed a day. I might have four or five other customers who were doubtless so surprised to see a girl selling raspberries on that remote wooded road that they felt a moral obligation to stop. Altogether, I would spend an hour picking the berries, 20 minutes riding to and fro on my bike, and three or four hours at this tent, and approximate total of six hours. I sold the berries for 75 cents a box, and if lucky I'd make six dollars a day. Six days at this tent. Some days spent under a village umbrella when it rained might yield $36 a week, which, when I was 10 and 11 years old, seemed a small fortune. I would sit in my chair and sometimes read, but mostly I'd stare off into space, occasionally noticing the way a pair of monarchs folded into each other when they mated, or the way the Queen Anne's lace seemed to have popped up open overnight. I learned to daydream that summer, and it was then that I conceived of the idea of Clara as still growing. She'd have been almost two year, years old that first summer, and probably a nuisance, but I imagined her wandering into weeds and wild flowers, the top of her head lost below the yellow and magenta blossoms, or reaching for a raspberry and tipping over a paint box. I imagined her on her tummy on top of my card table taking a nap while I stroked her back. Sunday is the anniversary of my mother's and Clara's deaths. I know it and my father knows it, but neither of us speaks of it all day. I know my father remembers because he keeps walking from the barn to the house and back to the barn again, as if he can't decide what to do with himself. He looks at me when he thinks I'm not aware of it. He wants to say something, but is unsure of what will happen to both of us if he does. He takes a shower at midday, which he almost never does, and spends a long time in his bedroom, where I know there is a picture of my mother and me and Clara. I'm twelve and keenly aware of milestones and anniversaries, and I think the day should be marked. Dad, I say when he finally comes out of the bedroom, can we go to the Batson's market? What for? he asks. I think they sell flowers there. He hasn't asked me what the flowers are for. The sun has been out for two days. I wore my jacket open. My father has on only a sweater. He's shaved and his hair is clean and he's not an embarrassment to be with, which is an improvement over the previous year. On the first anniversary of the accident, my father sat in the barn all day and didn't move. I felt lonely and sad and in need of comfort, but I didn't have the courage to walk through the barn and see what I might find there. My father, in the dead position, his mouth open, as if his nose were stuffed, his eyes vacant, seeing only images from the past. Instead I looked through my album, where I beaded necklace, answered the phone when my grandmother called, and then I cried for so long that she finally insisted I go get my father. At Batson's market, my father searches for dishwashing liquid while I stand in front of the refrigerated shelves that hold the bunches of flowers. There are daisies and 
carnations, baby's breath and roses, and even though the bouquets are all more or less alike, I spent a lot of time trying to decide which is best. The carnations look fake pink and bother me. One bucket, almost entirely yellow, has a long creepy looking flower in its center that might be a lily. That's one's pretty, my father says, painting to a bucket that is mostly lavender and white. What are those bluish purple flowers? I ask. I don't know. Do you think mom would like them? I think she would. He says, I clutch the bucket all the way home, trying to decide where to put it. We have a mason jar in a cabinet in the kitchen. I arrange them in that, I think, but I won't leave them in the kitchen. I could set them on the coffee table in the den, though that seems a little ordinary to me. If I put them in my father's room, I won't be able to see them. In the end, I set them on the shelf in the back hallway. I sit across from the flowers on the bench and admire them. My father says they look nice as he goes out to the barn. But something is still bothering me. They don't seem right inside the house, and more important, I'm afraid my mother and Clara won't be able to see them. It's illogical, of course, if Clara and my mother have become spirits who actually can see down to earth, then surely they can see through houses. But I can't shake the nation. I patted my jacket and walked the mason jar to the edge of the clearing before the woods begin. I set the jar in the snow. I stand back. The flowers seem more alive in the sunshine. I know they'll be die before morning but I'm oddly satisfied. I think about my mother and Clara. I shoot my eyes. I imagine them vividly. I do this periodically in order to keep the images clear and sharp. The pictures in my mind have warmth and smell and movement, treasures I cannot afford to lose. On the last day before Christmas vacation, we have a party in our homeroom at school. In New York we had combined Hanukkah Christmas celebrations, but in New Hampshire it is simply a Christmas party, there being no one in our school in need of Hanukkah. Gifts are exchanged and the boys are annoyingly manic because of the half day. I've drawn Molly Curran's name and have given her in keeping with a lifelong propensity to give gifts I really want for myself, a kit with 20 different colors of nail polish in it. I've gotten a tape of the police from Billy Brock, who's clearly operating on the same principle and worse, doesn't know me very well, since I don't own a tape player. On the bus on the way home from school, I debate asking my father for a tape player instead of a washing machine for Christmas. Is it too late, I wonder, to ask for both? After I hang up my jacket, I find my father in his shop. He's consumed with preparations for a glue-up, a precise and panicky procedure that in 15 minutes can ruin weeks of painstaking woodwork. One has to set the glue, bring the components together, apply suitable clamping pressure, test the squareness, and then clean up the excess, all in about a minute and a half. My father is making a drawer, the first of two that will be fitted into the openings of a small sideboard he has to finish before Christmas. It is his first commission. How was school? he asks. Good, I say. Last day. Yep. How was the party? Good. What did you get? A tape of the police. I look him in the eye and hope he's thinking. Tape player. Good idea for Nikki for Christmas. The day marks a week and two days since my father and I walked into the woods and bound a baby. 
I've been unable to keep from thinking about what might have happened to baby Doris had we not found her. I've imagined the sleeping back of frozen cocoon with long icicles falling like dodgers all around her. In a second call to Dr. Gibson, my father learned that the baby's toes would not have to be amputated. She's a fighter, the doctor told my father, a comment which, when relayed to me, filled me with pride. We also learned that she is to be collected today by social services and delivered to a temporary foster home. This information upset me greatly when I heard it, since I like having the baby in the hospital, having her contained there. We won't be told where she is going. The whole process strikes me as being a lot like the witness protection program, with its anonymity and its new cast of characters, new mother, new father, new brothers and sisters, won't even be told the baby's new name. Forever to us, she will have to be baby Doris. I leave my father and walk back into the house and into the kitchen, where I make myself a cup of hot chocolate. I stick an English muffin into the toaster and have an image of my mother mixing up a bowl of cottage cheese and peanut butter. Just the day before, I had a memory of my mother in her garden, bent straight over, her legs tanned, her shorts riding high on the her tights. My father was on the John Deere, headed toward my swing set. Because he was staring at my mother, trying, I think now, to get a good look at her from the front. He moved right into the swing set, of the prof of the John Deere catching on a swing and riding it up into the air. My father leaped off backwards and rolled out of the way. The engine cut out as he fell, but when he stood, the mower was still stuck in the swing, his nose pointed skyward. My mother began to laugh, laugh patting the back of her hand to her mouth. And last night I had a member of my mother lying beside my father on their bed, the loose strap of the sleep in which she slept revealing part of an engorged breast. They were talking softly so as not to wake Clara, barely a week old, in a cot next to the bed. What had they been talking about? Why had I gone into the room? I can't remember. As they whispered, a stain began to blossom on my mother's sleep, the milk leaking with surprising fluidity and enormous flowering. I remember my mother's hand going to her breast and her whispering to my father, Oh, Rob, oh, look, in the kitchen I smell smoke. The English muffin is struck in the toaster. I pull the plug, remove the muffin with a fork, and frisbee the child pack into the sink. I hear a knock down, and I think it's a branch tapping against the side of the house. Then I hear the human rhythm, three taps, a pause, another three, another pause, I think it might be the detective again, and I wonder if I should say my father isn't home. But what if the detective just burges through and finds out I'm lying? Can I be prosecuted for lying to an officer of the law? I move to the cloak room and open the door. A couple stands on the steps, and I see behind them that it has begun snowing lightly. The woman has large square glasses with blue tint frames and a hairdo one can't come by in the entire state of New Hampshire, sleek and thick and blunt cut. She wears glossy lipstick the color of cherries that matches her leather gloves. She has on a white down jacket she clearly hasn't bought at L.L. Bean. The man unzips his black ski parka, smiles and says, We held down at the antique store and that someone called Mr. Dillon makes furniture that looks like shaker. Are we in the right place? 
I say yes, they are, but I am puzzled. Hasn't it been more than a week since Switzer told the couple about my father's furniture? Where have they been in the meantime? In a time warp. I tell them to come inside because of the snow and that I'll be right back. I have to get my father, I add. Dad, I say when I reach his shop. There are two people here who want to see your furniture. I've interrupted him in the middle of the glue up. He shakes his head vigorously, as if to say, for heaven's sake, Nikki, not now. I take them to the front room. I offer. The man and the woman stamp the snow from their boots onto the mat. I tell them that my dad will be with them soon and that I take them to see the furniture. The woman glances over at the man and smiles, as if to say, isn't she cute? We walk through the kitchen and the dining room that is now a den. We pass the room my father and I never enter the room that is like a shrine. I show them into the front room where the furniture is, two straight back chairs, three small tables, a low square cocktail table, a walnut dining table, an oak bookcase, and a small cabinet. My goodness, the woman says. I see what the man at the antique store meant. The man says, This looks very much like shaker. Simple but beautiful, the woman says. Good finish, the man says. I wonder if they are complimenting my father's work for my benefit, if when I leave the room negative compliments will emerge. When people come to look at the furniture, my father almost always executes himself and goes outside for a smoke. He hates being a salesman. Customers usually come in pairs, couples from Massachusetts or New York, looking to take something back with them to the house or the apartment, something to remember the weekend or the vacation by. I am idly thinking about how to back the showroom when my father enters, whipping his hands on a rug. Sorry about that, he says as he crosses the threshold. My father hasn't shaved and he hasn't cut his hair. The lids of his eyes are pink rimmed. Oh God, has he been crying? No, I tell myself, it's the glue. His eyes are pink because of the fumes. He's covered with sawdust and he looks frankly frightening. There's a moment of silence, two moments anyway, enough to make me look over at the man who is staring at my father and then over at my father who is staring back at him. Robert, the man asks. Steve, my father says. The two men advanced to shake each other's hand. I heard you'd moved somewhere in New England. Steve says uh, in a disbelieving voice, as if he cannot credit what he is saying. I just never thought. Virginia, this is Robert Dillon. We used to work together in the city. Virginia steps forward and shakes my father's hand. His hand is rough and coarse, and I know it smells of turpentine. This is my daughter, Nikki, my father says. We've met, Steve says, smiling in my direction. She showed us in. There's another moment of silence. Well... Steve says, your work is beautiful, just beautiful, isn't it, Virginia? Yes, Virginia says, very beautiful. The man at the antique store was right. It bears a strong resemblance to Shaker. I glance at my father and his face makes my stomach feel, feel hollow. Listen, Steve says, putting his hand to his forehead. I just wanted to say... I never got a chance to tell you how sorry I was about, you know.
My father gives a quick shake of his head. You remember, Steve says to his girlfriend or his wife, I told you about the man whose wife and baby... Oh, oh yes, Virginia says in a gush of compre comprehension. Oh, I'm so sorry, she adds. It must have been so hard. My father is silent. Virginia clutches her pocketbook to her chest. Steve clears his throat and looks around the room. Are you still with Porter? My father asks. No, I'm on my own now. Steve says with apparent relief at the change of subject. I bought two condos in a building on 57th Street a year ago. He pauses. Worth twice what I paid for them already. We live in one, and I use the other for an office. I've got three guys working for me. Philip still uh, at the old place? My father asks. Philip? Steve says, shaking his head as if he can't just now remember who Philip is. Oh, Philip, he says. No, Philip's moved on to San Francisco. Well, my father says. Well, Steve says. The silence that follows is a white nose inside my head. Are you up here for a vacation? My father asks after a time. Yes, Steve says, once again looking relieved. We are skiing different mountains. We went up to Loon and to Sunday River, over to Killington. Where else did we go, Virginia? We headed home on Friday, taking advantage of the early snow this year, you know, before the Christmas crowds. Next to my father, Steve looks Polish to a high shin. How about you? How do any skiing? Used to, my father says. I do, I say simultaneously. We mostly snowshoe now, my father says, in the woods. Steve glances toward the window as if searching for the woods. Snowshoeing, he says, considering like to try that sometime. Yes, Virginia says. I've always wanted to try that. Must be quite uh, a workout, Steve says. It can be, my father says. So, Steve says, glancing around the room again. We've been looking for a cocktail table, and I think, Virginia, we just might have found what we're looking for. He moves to my father's table and runs his hand along the finish. I'm wondering if Steve and Virginia would be at all interested in the table if it weren't my father's, if my father hadn't lost his wife and baby, if my father didn't look as though he was on his last day. What kind of wood is this? Steve asks. Cherry, my father says. So it's this color naturally? Steve says, not a stain. No, it's natural. It's darkened up over time. Really? What kind of finish is this? A wax or polyurethane, my father says. What grade are you in? Virginia asks, taking a chapstick out of her pocketbook and running it across her lips. I'm in seventh grade, I say. She smacks her lips together, so you are twelve. That's a good age, she says, dropping the chipstick in her purse. What are you going to do over Christmas vacation? I think a minute. My grandmother is coming, I say. Oh, that's nice, Virginia says, slipping the strap of her purse over the shoulder. My grandmother used to make pepper noose at Christmas time. Do you know what it is? I shake my head. So what's the damage? Steve asked my father. They haven't, 
Virginia says. They rolled cookies made with honey and spices and then dusted with confection's sugar. My father clears his throat. He hates discussing money under the best of circumstances. Two fifty, he says quickly. I glance sharply up at him. I know the table had been priced at four hundred. I've studied the price list. Tucked inside each of the two hundred brochures he had printed up on Switzer's advice. My father hasn't given away more than twenty of them. Switzer argued with him about the pricing, insisting that my father was quoting figures that were too low. These are good, Switzer said. How many hours did you put into the table? That's irrelevant. My father says, not irrelevant if you want what's coming to you. My father won the argument, and he thinks his price is fair now, even modest. My father is living on the money from the sale of the house in New York, as well as my parents' savings. Still, though, selling the table for 250 is like giving it away. Salt, Steve says. There is moment then a task and a discussion about the logistics is of fitting the table in the couple's car versus having it sent. In the end, it's agreed that my father will have the table shipped collect. Discreetly, Virginia writes a check and lays it on an end table. We all walk to the back hallway. The couple zip up the parkas and shake my father's hand. Good seeing you, Steve says. Good meeting you, Virginia says to my father and me. You know, maybe we could get together, Steve says. Go out for dinner or have a drink. We're staying at the Woodstock in until Friday. How about I give you a call? My father nods slowly. Sure, he says. You got something to ride on, Steve asks. I'll take your number. My father disappears into the kitchen. This ought to be good, I'm thinking. Would you like to see my mural of ski mountains? I ask on a sudden impulse. Almost no one except my father and grandmother and Joe has seen it. Oh yes, we'd love to, Virginia says. Where is it? In my bedroom, I say. I turn and walk, trusting they will follow me. They do, peppering me with questions. Do I like living in a shepherd? Do I miss New York? Do I play any sports at school? I begin to regret the invitation when I notice the package of toilet paper rolls wedged between the railings on the stairs. I've left a wet towel on the landing and I can see that the bathroom is a mess, with tissues on the lip of the sink and another towel dropped over the toilet. My father and I clean the house on Saturday mornings. By Tuesday it's a mess. I wait for Virginia and Steve to climb the stairs. As we pass my father's room, I have the presence of mind to shut his door, preventing the couple from seeing the unmade bed and the laundry basket on the floor. By the time we reach my bedroom, I deeply regret my stupid idea. I haven't made my bed, my flannel pajamas are on the floor, and there's an empty ring-ding package on my bedside table. Worse, a pair of underpants is hooked over a chair post. Oh, it's fabulous, Virginia says. You're quite an artist. Steve says. I've never seen anything like it, Virginia says. What kind of paint did you use? Steve asks. I see the mural then for what it is, a poorly executed and primitive panorama of the three northern New England states, Canada glowing pinkly near the ceiling, Massachusetts spelled wrong and inceptly corrected with black paint, the pig slime colored while well, they've been overpainted white to signal that I've skied the mountain. You must be quite a skier, Steve says. 
Maybe you and your dad will come skiing with us. Virginia says in a voice I wouldn't use on a three-year-old. I pocket the underpants. Is that a chalet? Steve asks. Oh, look, Steve. Atiash, Virginia says. I move toward the doorway. You've got your father's talent, Steve says. Maybe you'll be an architect like he was. I'm going down, I say. It's a shame to have to give it up, Steve pauses. Not that the furniture isn't terrific, too. Was my dad good at it? I ask. The best, Steve says. He was a beautiful draftsman. Not all architects are. Oh, I say. It's probably why his furniture has such a nice line, he adds. Beats, Virginia exclaims. You make necklaces. We meet my father in the back hallway. Steve takes the piece of paper from him and waves it in the air. I'll give you a call, he says. I watch the couple walk to their car through the thickening snow. I notice that they don't speak to each other while Steve makes a three-point turn. A dead give away. They are waiting until they are out of sight. They both smile on cue as they take off down the drive away. You finish your blow up? I ask my father. It seems to take a minute for his eyes to focus on mine. Sort of, he says. Did you know him well? I ask. I don't remember him from when I visited your office. Not very well. He worked in another department. She's pretty, don't you think? I snatch a knitted cap from a hook and start to bat it in the air. I guess, he says, what did you write on this piece of paper? Just a number. Whose? No idea, he says. I pick up the cap which has fallen to the floor. You want a tuna sandwich? I ask. That sounds good. But still we stand in the hallway, neither of us willing to leave. I notice through the window that it's snowing more heavily now. Dad, I ask, moving closer to him. What? I pat the hat on my head. Did you like your job when you worked in New York City? I did, Nikki, he says. Yes, I did. Were you good at it? Being an architect? I believe I was. What kind of things did you design? Schools, hotels, some renovated apartment buildings. Will you ever go back to it? I ask. He plucks the cap off my head and pats it on his own. I don't think so, he says. Is this going to be a big snow? I ask. Could be, my father says. He looks silly in the hat. What a waste, I say. It's a vacation now. You just had a snow day, my father says. When's Grammy coming? I ask. Tomorrow night. Did you get my Christmas present yet? No telling, he says. I was thinking I might like a tape player. Actually, I need a tape player. Is that so, my father says. Later that afternoon, I'm working on the beaded necklace for my grandmother when I hear a motor. I go to the window and look out and see a small blue car in the driveway. I watch as it keeps going to the side of the barn where my father keeps his truck. Wow, I think. A Christmas rush. I run down the stairs and open the door. A young woman stands on the doorstep, her hands in the pockets of a pale blue parka. She looks up through her dark blonde hair. She pushes the hair off her face and tucks it behind her ear. Her hair is very fine and did straight. Is Mr. Dillon here? She asks in a voice so faint I have to lean my head out the door. 
Did you say Dylan? I ask. She nods. Yes, he's here. A man in the antique story says Mr. Dillon makes furniture and has some pieces for sale. That I should come up here and take a look? I'm sorry, I didn't know where to park. Her voice is strained, and he speaks in a rush. She has eyes that match her jacket, and her lashes are covered with flakes. The snow is making a lace cap at the top of her head. You better come in, I say. She steps across the threshold. Her jeans fall over her boots and are wet at the hems. She takes a quick glance around the back hallway, at the wooden hats and baseball caps, at the fall and winter jackets, at the back of road salt and a can of WD-40 on a shelf. It has grown darker with the snow, so I flip on the light switch. The woman flinches slightly with a small twitch of her heat. Her hair falls across her face again, and she tucks it behind her ear. I got my father, I say. I run along the passageway and into the barn. He looks up from the drawer he's working on. You'll never believe this, I say. We've got another customer. I thought I had a motor, he says. He returns with me to the house. The woman is still standing by the back door. Her shoulders are hunched, and she has her arms folded across her chest. The furniture in the front room, my father says, gesturing with his hand. I should take off my boots, the woman says. I'm about to say that it doesn't matter, but the woman is already unzipping a black leather boot. She shakes it off and then unzips the other. She places them side by side on the mat. The hems of her jeans fall to the floor. When she stands, I can see that her face is pasty, not unusual in the winter in New Hampshire. I need something for my parents for Christmas, she says. I can show you what I have, my father says. He glances through the window. You have any trouble with the road? he asks. It's pretty slippery, he says. I follow my father and the woman into the front room. Her parka flares at her hips. Her hair is caught in the back of her collar. She moves stiffly, and I'm guessing she's wishing that she hadn't come. In the front room, the light is such that my father and I can see what we didn't just an hour earlier. The cherry and walnut and maple tables and chairs are covered with a fine layer of dust. Let me get a cloth, my father says. When he leaves the room, the woman frees her hair from the collar. She unzips her parka. I examine her clothes. She has on a pink cardigan over a white blouse that she hasn't tucked into her jeans. At her throat is a silver amulet on a leather cord. I make beaded necklaces of fine rawhide with silver clasps. I plan to sell them in the summer with the raspberries. I like your necklace, I say. Oh, she says, her hand going to her throat. Thanks. I make jewelry, I add. That's great. She says in a voice that makes it clear that isn't thinking about jewelry. She fingers a table, leaving a mindering trail in the dust. So you need a present, I say. Yes, she says, for my parents. Do you live in Shepherd? I ask, pretty sure I haven't seen her here in town. I'm just shopping, she says. Sorry about this. My father says as he returns with a dust cloth. The woman stands to one side as he polishes the table. Your stuff is nice, she says. She wanders from piece to piece, touching each one of 
as she passes by. She wraps her fingers along the back of a chair and touches the side of a bookcase. She keeps glancing at my father. Maybe they'd like a bookcase, she says. I think she's going to add something else, but then she shuts her mouth. She has a full face, although she doesn't seem especially fat. Her eyes look around, though, as if they belong in a different face. An unhealthy face, maybe. There are bluish half-moons beneath her lower lids. I decide she's too embarrassed to ask about prices, so I volunteer the list. We have a price list, I say. My father gives a quick shake of his head. The woman tosses her hair out of her face. Yes, she says, sure. Ignoring my father, I take a pamphlet from the mantel and hand it to her. I watch as she reads it. What's this made of? She asks my father, pointing to a small cabinet. It's walnut. My father answers, failing to add that it has paneled doors, inset hinges, and a beeswax finish as well. He's hopeless as a salesman. And the woman walks around to the black of the chair. She puts a hand out and leans on it. This is really beautiful, she says. She takes a step sideways and catches the hem of her jeans under her foot. She bends and rolls the hem into the calf. I watch her as she does this. She rolls the other pant leg and stands, but I am still looking at her feet. In the moment that my mind registers the socks with the cable knit up the side, pale grey Angora socks, she says to my father, I didn't come here to buy a piece of furniture.